for years, I mean, this is an, an amazing mistake that I made. Like for years, I was, I was part of that just like idiotic cohort who went, okay, sleep is dead time. And how do I minimize sleep? Yeah. Anyone who is doing that is, that is just ridiculous. Hello and welcome back to All In, your weekly business fix here on Joe, backed by AIB. This week we're going to be looking at how to build a killer brand. What does it take to stand out in a crowded market? And is brand dominance the result of natural selection or strategy? Or maybe both. Here to answer those questions and more, I'm joined in studio by a woman whose products are flying off the shelves up and down the country. It's the Skin Nerds founder, Jennifer Rock, and the man at the helm of a multi-award winning household name whiskey brand. It's Jack Teeling from Teeling's Whiskey. Our all-in trailblazer interview is with a man whose $100 million kid tech platform is keeping children safe around the world. Serial entrepreneur Dylan Collins tells us why a founder who prioritizes sleep is the most important thing he's looking for when investing. But before all that, we have some big news to share. On the 29th of October, in the Chocolate Factory on King's Inn Street in Dublin, we'll be hosting the first ever live all-in show with some of our regular contributors, including Maximum Media founder Niall McGarry. Now, if you'd like to be there in the audience, you can get the details on the pinned tweet on our Twitter account. The username is at all in underscore business. And while you're there, why not hit subscribe to get the full show every week on podcast or on YouTube. You will, of course, find us, as I mentioned, on Twitter, on Facebook and on LinkedIn. And you can contact us on any platform at any time with the hashtag all in business. Joe presents all in together with AIB backing Irish business. So Jennifer and Jack, I'm going to jump straight in with the key question here. How do you build a killer brand? I don't think, well for me, I didn't necessarily set out to build a brand per se. I believe a brand is about reputation and a community and you almost attract like-minded people. So for our philosophy, it's all about skin, obviously, and being human and real and innovative and I suppose have a collaborative approach. And we've started gathering people that really align with that. And that's mm -hmm. where I suppose the word brand has started to come into it. But did I sit down originally with my first product and think I'm building a brand? No, it was more about seeing a niche in the market and it developed from there. So I guess, um, yeah, that's a key difference between you guys from the outset is that uh, you were a personal brand, I suppose, Jennifer, a uh, skin consultant before you ever were a product brand, whereas you, Jack, were from the outset building on a legacy brand, a kind of a lapsed legacy brand. Oh, well, I, don't, I wouldn't consider a legacy brand. We have history mm. within the category dating back to the 18th century, which was a kind of our starting point of what we were trying to do and why, I suppose, we're using our name, mm. um, tealing on our brand. Um, but, you know, our, we're in a very brand heavy industry. Um, um, it's a lifestyle brand. Uh, people drink whiskey in particular because of the brand association that they have. So, so we came at it from day one in terms of trying to create a new brand um, uh, that could build on you know, what has gone before. Like I say, respectful to the past, but confident to do things in a more modern way and do something that we felt was relevant to a new generation of consumers looking for something different um, and catering for, for people who wanted to uh, evolve. Um, um, their taste and identify with a brand that was trying to do something different. Because, um, um, you know, we're in al alcohol. So either you're selling ethanol or you're selling a brand um, which elevates that alcohol into something um, that's more than some of its parts. And uh, uh, so from day one, uh, we saw, had a consumer insight, something that we felt was, was relevant, um, uh, meant something to us. Um, and we, we, we started from there and we've gone to where we are now. And uh, a question for both of you or either of you, what are the perks of starting with a blank canvas and how do you manage those perks in line with taking on some of both of you, taking on some of the biggest and best known brands in the world? Like you had to take on La Roche-Posay, L'Oreal, you had every whiskey brand in the world you had to take on. Yeah. Uh, that must have been daunting. I think you can overthink it, to be honest. And I suppose okay. where we're different perhaps is that for me, it wasn't sitting out and saying, right, how am I going to compete with? I'm quite comfortable with my own personal philosophies, which then ripple out through my team and the product. And 
what we represent for stands on shelf. So it's charismatic and educational and there's always clinical data behind it. So I kind of feel comfortable in my own space and we were fortunate in enough skin, in my own skin. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose we were fortunate enough to have had the community behind us of tens of thousands of people that were already really understanding and recognised what we stood for. So that, I suppose, gave us a slight advantage when we put a physical product on a shelf mm. that people understood, as you say, the brand. And in that network, you know, how did you build it? Who's in it? So, yes, I suppose for me, it started off, I'm a professional beauty therapist. That's my trade. And then I worked a lot in skincare abroad and really lectured people to be the best therapist they could be, be it practical or, or retail elements. And so at home in Ireland, I suppose I was lucky enough to kind of be placed in the world of media as an expert in skincare. So that opened up social media where people started, you know, coming along and loving that I wasn't biased to any particular brand. I, I still to this day, if I believe something else is right for you, if it's a La Roche-Posay product, I'll recommend it because the ingredient is right for the human that I'm talking to. Mm. So for me, I suppose the community started with social media and just gathering momentum. It has been quite organic. And then we have my other business is called Nerd Network, where it's effectively, it's an e commerce business in a sense so it's an online entity but it has a consultancy aspect so you join Nerd Network you meet with a nerd or nerdette who's one of my therapists and they teach you all about your skin so what you need to know what you don't want to know what you should do what you shouldn't do and after that you have access to a hub where you can purchase the products from us and more importantly in my opinion you get access to podcasts webinars mm -hmm. Facebook lives events so it, it is it's quite intimate so we're 15,000 people and growing over the last two years now that so that I I suppose has really helped me to understand who I'm talking to. I really have a really good feel of who our client is, what she likes, what she doesn't like, what she'll spend, what she won't spend. And you don't have to sit down then and think, right, how am I going to do some market research? You're in the market research. I live in it, day. but like yeah. I'm guilty of not having a great work-life balance. So I would sit on social media at night and chat to my end user quite regularly. So mm. I see them as like they're the reason we are where we are, and we've so much more to go, so many more exciting things to bring to market. So I suppose always, always talking to the person that means that I have the data mm. and the insight to know right, this is what I should create next. If that didn't work, let's tweak it. Let's do that because they're telling us yeah. directly. And I guess in the fact that you did that first and then came the products. But for you, Jack, how did you decide who your tribe was going to be and then find or build that tribe? So I, I started working uh, in my father's distillery, Cooley Distillery, and I went around the world trying to promote the brands that they have. So in terms of dealing with legacy brands, I came into a company um, that already had long established brands in terms of pricing, in terms of promotion, in terms of what they were trying to do. Um, and tried to put my mark on that and uh, uh, went around the world trying to promote these brands and we struggled, mm. struggled to, to, to connect um, um, some legacy issues around pricing and we had all these amazing stories, loads of stories, too much to tell sometimes mm. that confused consumers and the trade um, um, and uh, you know I took my learnings of what was working, what wasn't working from, from, from those experiences. So when I went out my own in 2012, literally had that blank canvas. So you could take all the consumer insights, everything that you wanted to, to build on and start from scratch. And, and, you know, that's what we did. So we focused on having a clearly differentiated functional product. So a taste profile that was very, very different. Mm. Uh, we went with a, a different pricing, a premium pricing, because uh, you might have a great story. But if you don't price it correctly, then you undersell what it is. So mm -hmm. second... You can you know, tell your story and then you go to the price and you go, well, that's too cheap. It doesn't tie into the story, so there's something wrong. Yeah. Um, and also you can't compete against the big guys, so we went for a premium pricing. Um, we went for a differentiated packaging um, and obviously our story is different. So, so you know, to be clear and holistically different across the way to try and be a, an addition to the category rather than to try and rob. So that mm -hmm. was the key thing for us, that we felt it was an opportunity to bring some breadth, some choice to the industry um, and that we could rob from other categories outside of Irish whiskey. And, uh, uh, um, but it was, if it wasn't from my experience at the coalface, uh, you know, I wouldn't have that insight. And I think it's, it's harder for people who are coming into the industry who haven't had, you know, let's say the trials and tribulations at the coalface in the trenches to understand, you know, the nuances that are required to be successful. Well, you mentioned a couple of things there that, that I think uh, are really interesting in terms of building a killer brand. So uh, packaging and pricing, and let's go backwards, let's start with pricing, because I know that both of you have gone for um, affordable luxury. What does that mean or how do you decide 
for your product what that means. Um, affordable can mean a lot of different things to different people. Same yeah. with luxury. So yeah, how do you no, do? Oh, for me in terms of it was <clears throat> something that people could 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 spend money on. So uh, it won't be cheap. It wasn't mm. going to be the same as the market leader, but um, they were going to maybe take a slight risk. Um, um, uh, but it wasn't going to cost the arm and leg. And in our category, there's lots of very super premium products, and they tend to end up on shelves, and they only get open on special occasions. So we wanted to create uh, basically a ladder mm -hmm. um, and go for where white white space was. So so when I was starting in 2012, all the big brands, um, um, no, don't need to name them, but they're all at a certain price point. They're all fighting with each other. They're all mm. doing price offs, and it's just it was noisy. And if you went into there, it's like a honeypot. That's where all the volume is. You get killed. You just get washed away. There's no way you can compete. Yeah. And then there was some very super premium. And there was this lovely kind of white noise uh, where, where no one was actually creating you know, uh, an alternative. Um, and I looked at other categories, and it, it was at a certain price point that where people... Uh, were willing to trade up. So it happened in vodka, it happened in tequila, it happened in everything else. Mm. And there was nothing I felt that was, was there, that bridge into the, the, the discovery points in the category. And that's, we engineered our product to hit that, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, to allow us to, to cater for that. So let's say if it's in the US, it was around 35 to 40 dollars here in Ireland, 35 to 40 euros, mm. um, um, which uh, you know, might seem a lot, but you know, if you think you're paying uh, 28, uh, 30 euros for other brands, it's, for me, it's an affordable luxury. And, and, and we wanted a product that people could consume on a regular basis, open up and enjoy. Yeah, not a once a year thing. Yeah, not a thing, not gathering dust on the shelves. Yeah. Yeah. And what about you, Jennifer? Because uh, I, I read an Irish Times review of one of your products there last night that said, I um, can't remember how the author phrased it, but it was basically the essence of it was, if she got into this for profits, <laughs> This isn't going to work. You know what I mean? Like her products are amazing, but they could be more expensive, which I thought was unusual because I would think that they were probably your pricing is right in the middle. I think our story is similar. So mm -hmm. for me, again, having the community that I listen to daily and I genuinely do respect greatly, I realised that the products that were mass market available to skincare users were about six, seven, eight, nine, ten euro, but mm. maybe wouldn't have the clinical information or the ingredients at the potency that would truly make a difference to your skin. And realistically, why most people buy skin is to feel better in themselves, had confidence and just, you know, be able to put their best foot forward. So that wasn't maybe reaching what I wanted it to. And then similarly, you have many different companies and brands that will have products that are 100, 150, 200 euro for the smallest little pot. And it's a story. And I understand that there's a brand behind it. But where the discrepancy in my world coming from the training background and the education background of skin was that there was nothing in the middle that kind of brought the two together. So to have a story, to have fun, to have education, mm. but to have clinical ingredients. And that's where we kind of, as you say, found that sweet spot in the middle. So that's where we've been fortunate. That article is right, though, to be honest, mm. in that the level of ingredients I've put in, it could be and probably should be, you know, a lot more expensive than what it is. But in order to get results with skincare, you should be using every morning, every evening. So if you invest in a 60 euro product, it runs out fast, yeah. it runs out fast yeah. but then you're not going to replenish. You're, not, you're going to use it once a week, twice a week. So you don't see the same returns, so mm -hmm. you don't make the reinvestment. So for me, it was about creating a product that you could afford, that you could put on every morning, every evening, see a difference and then continuously use it. And I suppose that was the middle part that I'm really happy that I feel we've achieved that. Well, just to, sorry to build on that is, you know, when you're a new brand and you're going for that premium positioning, you have to exceed consumer expectations. Mm -hmm. So in a way, you nearly have to over-engineer the quality of your product uh, to justify your price positioning, um, uh, as we did in terms of the liquid. Like, you know, you actually have to make it... We like to say you have to have a world-class liquid to get in the game, mm -hmm. and then to, to win, you have to be a world-class brand. But you start at a function level and exceed expectations in terms of what the quality of your product needs to be. Right. So product comes first, and, and let's talk about the products themselves. Packaging. Yes. Who wants to go first? I know you've got some <laughs> products here, so we might as well look at what we're you talking mean, we about. Should, some liquid inspiration to, to help. Um, <laughs> um, and I, I suppose you start with the products. Mm. So what's in the bottle? Lead with the liquid is something that I was always taught. And again, you have to uh, create that world-class liquid to, to, to be able to compete in the game. Um, but you know, people consume with their eyes mm. as much as, as, as their palate. Uh, it's a very much a tactile industry that we're in. So, um, um, you know, our ethos is to be respectful, mm. you know, know where we've come from, but forge that new future. Um, and we, 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 uh, we went at it in a very similar way from a packaging perspective. So, so I was always uh, very keen on old bottles. I love old bottles, um, dark, 
brown, dark, uh, impure glass that they used to have back at the start of the 20th century. So I, I wanted to, to revive that and bring that mm. back. Um, and I had to go to Italy to find a, a, a manufacturer to do it. So I started right, off with okay. the bottle. Um, but I wanted to create something that stood out for the right reasons on the packaging. So I went to a design house in, in London who had actually never done anything with an Irish whiskey before um, and pitched it to them in terms of what we were trying to do. And they came up with the design. Um, Let's just turn that slightly to the Oh, yeah, sorry. Yeah, uh, which is, a you know, it's a diamond-shaped label. Um, but at the core of it, is our logo um, and uh, originally actually came up with a different iconography that's on it but what we wanted to get across was revival and mm. that was you know reviving the city in the city centre of Dublin which is our brand home um, um, but also revival our, our family's involvement in it so we have a phoenix rising from a pot still but then we have all the premium cues people expect in terms of uh, the bottling date we have my signature because I sign off in every batch Sounds a lot better job than in reality <laughs> what it is. Um, and we bottle at a higher alcohol strain. Lots of things to justify the mm. premium positioning. Um, so um, everything on that label then by the sounds of it has a very specific, very well thought out reason for being there. Definitely, right. definitely. Um, um, so, you know, again, the premium cues, the, the small batch nature of everything that we do, the premium nature of it. Um, um, and also we took inspiration from other categories. So not just Irish whiskey, it was happening, what was happening in, in, in premium craft spirits globally, mm. and then bringing back and trying to apply it in, in, a, in a way that fitted within consumer parameters of expectations for whiskey. So we could have done something crazy like in gin, but it doesn't resonate with consumers of whiskey. So mm. you have to play within certain rules of engagement and uh, we, 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 we push it as far as we could. One thing I'm, I'm curious about before I get to your products, Jennifer, um, is uh, how decisions are made, but then also what if they don't land and, and what's the, how long do you give something? So let's say you launch that and you have your reasons, you wanted old world bottle, impure glass, etc. And you may think the consumer wants that, but what if you're six months in and it's just hasn't landed with Joe and Jane public? Well, I, I think he's, then, you yeah, well, look, it's, it's, I'm, I'm sure um, on, on the shows you talk about pivoting and <laughs> pivot yes, yeah. yeah. and reality is when you're starting with business, you get out there, you get going, you, mm. you, you, you have an idea. Reality is it mightn't work out that way and you always have to be flexible. And the thing is being a smaller brand or a company, you have to listen, you have to have the fingers on the pulse. And if consumers aren't necessarily fully engaged with what you're doing, be able to evolve to take advantage mm. of it. I think there's a bit of a challenge with whiskey in that it takes a long time to to get products out to the market. Um, um, and we, we had done quite a bit of research beforehand that we felt pretty comfortable that we did. But um, we've had to change some things in terms of products and mm. um, um, evolve our packaging, evolve different pieces as you go along. And you always have to be improving. You know, and consumers are changing all the time. Yeah. So um, um, you have to be open, you have to be listening, you have to be responsive. And at the end of the day, as a smaller brand or a smaller company, that's all we have. Mm. You know, the big guys, they like to say they're brand custodians, they're great, they manage, they give oxygen, they spend tons of money. But like we're like speedboats and we have to be very responsive and, and be able to listen and react yeah. in it's a timely analogy. fashion. You've got a dart in and out. Exactly. You know, that's, that's all we have is our mm. advantage. If we don't do that, then, you know, how are we going to compete against these big multinationals? And would that be true for you as well, Jennifer? Let's, let's get some of your products up here front and centre. For me, I, I agree. I think it's about what's inside the product first and foremost. That's what will allow mm. people to return. What's in your best known care? product now of these? Oh, goodness. Our Could two we... best sellers, all of them. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Our two <laughs> best sellers are number two and number three. So to explain it, to put into context, in skincare, one of the most commonly asked questions people will say is, well, how often do I apply it and when should I apply it and mm. so on and so forth. So they're called the core four, so they're ultimately numbered so that somebody can know exactly when to use them. For me, it had to be packaging. You're right. I completely agree. I think packaging draws somebody in. They start to understand who you are, what your DNA might be, mm. um, and it's kind of what might differentiate you from a competitor. Yeah, so the colour was quite cool. significant for us because in skincare it's typically quite a blue and white and grey sector. Mm. So I really wanted to bring, we're quite proud to be a little bit, you know, have charisma and character and that's okay. You, you know, we want to feel good in yourself so that, you, you know, you put, you, um, I suppose you are yourself. So you're allowed to be a little bit flamboyant. I'm interested that you put the, put a lot of the writing on the front rather yes. than the back. Is that to highlight obviously the, the fact that you have certain ingredients that you won't get. I didn't want the packaging get. to be beautiful. I just wanted right. it to be simplistic and 
all be about, everything be about what was inside. But the more I started to listen and learn, I realized that I could use this as a tool for education. So the color means that someone can just say, I use the purple one. They didn't have to remember the long name and it wasn't sure. in French. Mm. The number meant that they knew exactly what order to apply it. The writing on the front, as you referred to, teaches somebody exactly what it is, who mm. it's for, who it's not for. And then on the back, it's heavily infographic led. So it tells you where you apply it. Is it from the nipple up? Is it not? Is it for mm. the eyes? Is it not? Can you use it if you're pregnant or can you not? So that mm. at any given time, regardless of having had training with our brand, you could really understand if it was for you. So that was kind of the goal of our packaging, that it embodied what we are, which is colourful, not that that's the first thing they should recall, but that we're really educating you. And there's never a step in the journey with us as a company that you will not know how to use the product to the best of your advantage. And then you can contact us online and we'll support you with the real life living woman seven days a week to understand mm. that you can get that support. I think the packaging is it's, it's key to stand out. And I think it's, you know, it's a visual representation of what your brand is. Um, but you have to stand out for the right reasons. Mm. You know, there's no point of just being weird and wacky if it doesn't doesn't land. Yeah. Doesn't, and it's about mm. holistically. It's the product, the packaging, the story, the pricing. They all have to work together for you. And I, Killer Brand is uh, we don't see ourselves Killer Brand. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we don't try and kill anyone. <laughs> but uh, you know, to be a successful brand, that's what you have to do because you, you'll be found out. Mm. You know, if there's one thing that falls down, you can have the best product in the world. You put it in, you know, pretty plain, boring packaging, it just won't work. So, you know, it's, uh, or if your, your story doesn't resonate, if your social media uh, doesn't tie in with your brand, c modern consumers will just lose interest and think, you know, there's something yeah. not right here. And uh, so we've talked about product and we've talked about packaging. What about timing? How, or, uh, how can you or can you catch the crest of a wave and how important is that? I suppose like with everything in life, there's, there's a time for it. So mm -hmm. for us, everything just happened to fall into place. Mm -hmm. I'd love to sit here and lie and say I was strategically aligned and I knew on this date at that time, yeah. but it wasn't. The demand was there, noticed the niche, you know, kind of got the ducks in a row, listened to, the, uh, listened to our clients and understood what they wanted. Mm -hmm. And I suppose before we started dealing with retailers and hundreds and hundreds of distributors, the reality was we knew that our own clients would want it. So that kind of gave me the security that... Made timing less relevant to 100%, them, right? yeah. yeah. So I had the audience to start with. They were already intrigued. A lot of them actually came on with the trials. They used in what we called Project Love Your Skin. They, they used it while it was in really ugly sample tester bottles. They saw the difference in their skin. They started talking about it. Then we went to retailers. So I suppose we had the confidence and the baseline to start with. But timing in life, it, with everything, personal mm. and work, there's always there's a time for everything, definitely. And what about you, Jack, in terms of, because obviously you, you were launching off the back of your story and your family story but would it have been like you know why 2012 would it have been different if you'd done 2005 or yeah I, I think it would have been different but I suppose it was just the window of opportunity I had to go out on my own um, uh, our previous distillery had been sold mm. um, you know all the ducks aligned uh, to find a property in the city centre at the depths of the uh, the property crash, you know, it was just lucky. So personal um, timing then is as important lo as market timing. And, 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 but you also, you know, I suppose you have to be ready to be able to, to take that jump of, of, of uh, leap yeah. of fate, let's say. Um, but you know, I suppose our industry is a bit weird because the cycles are long. Mm. Um, they don't, they're, they're not like a couple of years, they, they're like a couple of decades. decades yeah. <laughs> um, um, it could change, but you know, uh, um, um, the segmentation, the opportunity premiumization was, was only beginning and it's still only beginning. Mm. So, you know, it's only evolving as we, as we, we sit here now and, uh, you know, a lot more new entrants into the category. I think, uh, you know, it was a perfect window for me and I, I, I felt it was by far the biggest opportunity because I'd learned a lot and, you know, someone's going to grasp that premium positioning and I felt I was the best dressed to be able to do that. Mm. Um, um, have we grasped it fully? Definitely not. Huge amount of work to still go, but uh, you know, there's some ho hopefully solid foundations there to build from. And do either of you have any examples you'd like to give of maybe companies or products uh, you admire for getting it all right or getting as much right as they possibly can? Well, I, 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 again, it's it's not an overnight success. Like, mm. you know, there's, well, there's two actually. There's one um, um, people all know Hendrix Gin. Every Hendrix Gin. Oh, it's it's new. It's 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 new. It's been around for like for nearly twenty years. Mm. Um, uh, they saw a trend way before it actually happened, um, uh, and they were consistent and they kept going after and being this wacky kind of you know Scottish gin, you know, uh, with an unconventional approach. 
um, um, and uh, you know they saw the trend from way out, but mm -hmm. it took a long time to actually get there. Uh, so ag again, sometimes people see these things and say, "Oh, crest of a wave." Well, no, they probably helped create the wave as much as anything else, but it was more led by consumer interest in something different. Uh, another one is, and again, if you go to the to the US, uh, you'll see it everywhere. Uh, it's Tito's vodka. Mm -hmm. um, Tito's vodka is, a, is, is you know if you look at the packaging and you look at everything around it, you kind of go, "How the hell is this successful?" Uh, but it's it's phenomenal growth story, and if people don't know about it, they should read about it because uh, you know it, it, they were literally the crest of a wave of Americana and getting away from you know the bling, mm -hmm. um, like the Grey Goose is the absolute to more of a you know this is a good quality yeah. product at a good price. Um, it's literally a man and his dog, isn't it? Man and his dog. Like, it's Can't crazy. get any more simplistic. It's crazy. It's like you know, Tito is Tito, who makes the vodka in yeah. Texas and uh, has created a whole American Texas uh, vodka phenomenal mm -hmm. success story. Um, and it, but again, um, people think it's overnight. But he was flogging away with him and his dog, going bar to bar, trying to sell it, and you know was struggling until the kind of. Uh, the trend that, and the opportunity he saw caught up with him. Mm. So sometimes you can be too early. Yeah. Um, and again, I think there is an element of luck, but you make your own luck as well. Mm. What about yourself, Jennifer? I suppose brands that I tend to respect would be ones that have like an emotive impact. Mm. So if I look at Virgin, for example, so many different sectors, but I fly quite regularly to the States with Virgin. And I don't know if you've ever seen you know, when you sit down on the plane and everyone does that kind of intro and you all switch off, they just make it in entertaining, informative. Mm. And I think you just un they, they really understand who their audience are. And then Nike, they don't really tend to show their brand per se, but they teach you how you'll feel in yourself when you wear the product. And I just think that's a really clever, clever way to explain this is your life that you'll lead mm. or you'll hopefully lead or more likely to lead if you're using it. And I suppose to bring that back to skincare, that's what we're about. We're trying to empower people while entertaining them slightly and educating them as to what is right for them. So if they see these as, I will actually leave the house that makeup on, I'll allow my husband to see me <clears throat> first thing in the morning that makeup on, or I'll go to the school gate and not feel that pressure in my 30s or 40s because mm. I actually don't feel so great in myself, then that's the kind of link I'd love for people to see as the brand. Okay, and one final question, a little bit off topic, um, but I know you have strong feelings on it, uh, in particular, Jennifer, the value of company culture in creating your brand. Why is that so important to you? I think it's quite, I think it's a phrase that's used a lot at the moment. And to be mm. honest, I'm only self-employed two years and there's just shy of 20 people working for me now. So it's all a new concept. But coming from a beauty therapy background where it, it's not really a regulated space, there was no kind of, I suppose there was no talk around how do you mind your staff? There's quite a high turnover in, in the industry because mm. it's retail based and so on. So for me, it was really important that I genuinely found people that <clears throat> not just love skincare, but would stand for what I stand for. So work hard, but give back and genuinely, and it sounds like such a cliche, but just be a kind person. And, you know, the way in which I operate in business would, would resonate. I don't really like the way some people might act in business. Mm. So everyone that's come to work for me would be of similar mind and that's how we operate regularly. So we have a lot of team leads. I have a lot of consultants that come in that work with the team because I do believe my responsibility is to the company, but the people that allow the company be what it is to this day in such a fast, short space of time has been those humans. And how do I help those humans? Mm. But by giving them the tools they need and the time they need to, to grow. And so what, what if you... You're just shy of 20 people now. What if you find that you've hired someone who isn't really your kind of people or isn't really getting it or buying into the... They, the brand. We, we've had it and it, yeah. it's like do you ever you know the way you've had friends when you're younger and then you turn into your 20s and your 30s and everyone's life starts to go off yeah. in different tangents that's almost what it's like you mm. don't have a lot in common they don't bring a lot to the meeting they understand themselves they're the similar so it tends to either they tend to phase out or perhaps it's a situation that contracts aren't renewed so mm. for me who is in the building is as important as what's inside these bottles they're part and parcel they are the same thing so culture is a word that you can't touch but I believe when I leave the building, the guys, the team should be, the humans, the nerds, they're acting like I would, because mm. not because they're compliant with our philosophy, but because they are it, they live it. Okay. They, you know, they've committed to it because it's, they're into it, they believe in it, it's them. And do you so. feel the same, Jack? Oh, totally. I mm. think uh, it's very, um, uh, you know, when you're a smaller company, they take a huge amount of direction from the founders and you know, the senior management that are actually there. And as they say, you have to write people on the bus you also have the right people in the right seats in the bus, all that kind of stuff like that. But it's true. And uh, I think uh, when you're very much a brand-focused uh, company, 
your brand values have to resonate in the culture of your organization as well. Um, uh, we have up to around 85 different people and uh, you know, we're trying to, it gets harder as you get bigger mm. um, yeah. to, to make sure that the same kind of values you, you have to start when you have all the energy of getting up and running and you're building something and you're, you're flying and there's lots of things going on. And you, you keep that going um, as the, the business evolves. Um, and you get a little bit more structure and you have these things, you know, a little bit more management, SOPs, all that lovely stuff that goes into it. Um, but, you know, it, 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 it's critical. Uh, and we have young people around the world. We have young people in our distillery, our uh, brand ambassadors, our tour guides. Um, they're all a reflection of the brand. Mm. Um, and they have to act the same way that you would act and, and embody the same values um, because they embody the brand. And if they don't follow through on that, well, then, again, the brand falls down. Mm. Um, and we've been very lucky to get passionate people who believe in what we're doing, believe in the brand, and have been, you know, done a much better job than I have in terms of bringing that brand to life. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, long way continue. I think that's what, <clears throat> excuse me, I think that's what allows the end user to see that it's real. So if you walk into Nerd HQ, there's never a sweet to be seen. We all generally do drink a lot of water. There's fruit and veg everywhere. It's because I believe that the skin isn't just topical products. You have to look after yourself on a whole. We cover our screens with blue filter protection. So it's, it's, it's literally in every single part. You go yeah, to the bathroom life, and there's yeah. spritzes there for your face. It's, you know, so it's not just nine to five, ha you know, on off. It's, mm -hmm. it is who you are and it is who they are. And it just means you enjoy yourself so much more so you can give so much more love to to your role okay i think that's a really good place to leave it uh well don't go anywhere jennifer and jack and don't you go anywhere because jennifer and jack will be back with us very shortly to tell us about their one to watch the who or what has caught their eye in business this week and why now, you'll already know my next guest if you're a gamer. His company, Demonware, was acquired by Activision. Then his next company, Jolt Online, was acquired by GameStop. Now he's in kid tech, and unsurprisingly, that venture has been a huge success too. It's super awesome founder, Dylan Collins. Okay, so Dylan, super awesome is starting to get really super awesome. Tell me a bit about the business so far and, and the latest on it. Uh, well, we started Super Awesome about six years ago um, to build all the technology uh, that enables um, children to engage safely with the internet. Um, there's more and more kids going online. Um, they were now 40% of all new internet users in 2018. Um, and in parallel to that, um, all of Super Awesome's technology is being used um, more and more to enable safer and safer engagement with kids. So essentially what we're seeing is the internet is becoming you know, bifurcated between adult users and younger um, users. Um, and you know, I think it's becoming clear to everyone that we need very specifically designed technology to allow kids to, to interact digitally with the world that we can't rely on technology that was just designed for adults to give a safe experience for kids. So as a result, you know, Super Awesome has become bigger and bigger. I think more and more you know, people understand us to be building the infrastructure for the children's internet um, around the world. And um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, I think it's, it's become a mission. And who would you be pitching that to, your, your products and your platform? Would it be parents who'd be most interested? Would it be advertisers? So we work with all companies who are essentially trying to create experiences for kids. So it could be content owners, it could be brands, it could be app developers, it could be YouTubers and influencers. Anyone around the world who is you know, facilitating some kind of engagement with kids, whether it's, it's um, community or video or advertising or anything like that, all of that runs through our technology to make sure that what the children are engaging with is completely safe and appropriate, that it's not tracking any of their personal data, you know, and that fundamentally it, it is a safe and good experience. So, you know, it's, it's, it's sort of the entire ecosystem. You know, this kind of comes back to the point, Silicon Valley um, never thought about kids. The internet was never designed for children. We're building all of that technology that should have been built to make the internet a safer place for kids. And you started this six years ago, not that long ago. The internet obviously has been around for a much longer time. What do you think accounts for the delay in companies and founders like yourself starting to, to cater for that and starting to build that ecosystem? Um, I think Silicon Valley never really considered kids. And I guess there's a few reasons behind that. I think, you know, probably one of them was that an awful lot of founders when they were building um, platforms and apps and services, 
you know, they were younger people who didn't have kids themselves. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, I think anyone who's a parent um, and anyone who's not a parent will know those completely different worlds in, in, in terms of who you start to take a, um, account of and account for. Um, so as a result, we saw the biggest consumer platforms in the world really created without any notion or idea that children could possibly use them. And I think because the major technology companies never thought about kids, we, we, we didn't see any startups spinning out of those big tech companies, which meant nobody was educating all of the investors, which meant very, very little got built or financed to cater for children. Um, you know, becoming now the sort of the, the dominant online audience. Um, so it's, it's, there's some interesting historical origins there. Mm, and some interesting developments in the future, of course, as the age of consent continues to decline. Where would you see uh, the ecosystem and indeed your own role in it going and evolving to a point, you know, wh where is it going to go in the next 10 years, we'll say? Well, I think, you know, um, five years ago, 10 years ago, you know, the the the, the average internet age was much, much older than it is today. You know, as I said, you know, last year, 40% of new internet users were children. Um, 170,000 kids go online for the first time every day. The future of the internet is much, much younger. Mm -hmm. um, and with all of these kids coming online, you know, you're now seeing all of these privacy laws, all of these laws to protect children being rolled out across the world, starting in the US, moving into Europe, China has now adopted them. So the future of the internet is essentially a two-lane highway. Um, it's one for adults and it's one for children. Um, and the children's lane is all about privacy and safety, which in many respects is the opposite, right, uh, of, of the adult internet, you know, where everything tracks us all the time. And um, the kids' internet is absolutely, absolutely the opposite of that. And our paths crossed earlier this year at uh, RISE. Um, I was there with Web Summit, you were there launching Ruckus? Yeah, so we announced, we announced um, a video service for kids uh, called Ruckus earlier in the year, and we'll be rolling it out next year in 2020. Um, it is a free video platform for kids. Um, it, it allows video creators and influencers mm -hmm. to engage with children um, safely, uh, provide safe monetization, and just sort of a safer environment for kids to get videos. I think you know, everyone has seen a lot of the challenges that YouTube has had with kids. You know, and again, this comes back to the point that YouTube was never designed for a children's audience. Mm -hmm. It was only ever designed for adults. So it's a very, very exciting new development. We've got, we've got a lot of people um, speaking to us about it at the moment. And um, you'll hear more from us about Ruckus in 2020. And do you think segregation kind of then is the way to go there where if kids have a dedicated platform that they can go to like Ruckus, that eliminates an awful lot of the difficulty people you've mentioned like YouTube have had to deal with in trying to cater to both adults and children at the same time when they're not the same? Well, I think it's, it's a combination of things. I think fundamentally you've got to release the technologies and tools that make it easier to create kids' experiences, right? The challenge today is that because um, none of the major tech companies have invested in tools and platforms to make it easier to create kids services. There's fewer, there's fewer quality kids services being created. So we're taking sort of both approaches. One, we've built all of the infrastructure. So, you know, today, if you look at kids apps and services, a huge number of those are built on our platform. We're enabling all of those things to exist. We're also stepping forward and saying, okay, in certain areas, particularly around video, and, and creators, we're going to build additional platforms on top of that that provide some of the services as well. So I think you, you can never rely on a single platform um, that all of the kids in the world are going to, are going to want to be on, right? That, that very, very rarely happens. But you can make sure that overall kids' experiences are easier to make and, and can be you know, much more prevalent than ever before. And what you do now is very, very different to what you've done before. People who are into gaming especially might know you from Demonware and Jolt Online. Um, what kind of inspired you to get into the semi-philanthropic side of things? You know, you, I suppose you can kind of now feel like you are doing good, you're protecting children online. Is it very different? Um, uh, and is the payback, even psychologically, from doing something good, is it high enough that you'll probably never go back? The, that's about three very heavy <laughs> questions right there. Um, I think, you know, I, I spent the first part of my career building video games or video games related companies. Um, 
and parents hated me for that. And, and yeah, to, to, to some degree, I guess um, this, is, this is kind of making up for it. I think it's, it's very rare in one's life that you get an opportunity to build a company that is actually, you know, objectively doing some good. You know, with Super Awesome, you know, we are, we are on a mission. Um, you know, we are making the internet safer for kids. We obviously have a commercial model behind that, but it entirely aligns. You know, so I think it's 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 definitely one of the most unique opportunities. I would say the most unique opportunity I've ever seen and been involved with. So it's special, and it, it feels good, and, and it feels important. And and I think it's it's really hard to sort of look someone in the eye, you know, either as a founder or as an investor, you know, and sort of say, hey, this thing that I'm doing, this is really important, and you should get involved because it's really important. Mm. And that must be something of a confidence boost to you that you know you know that you're on a mission, you're trying to achieve some good in the world. It must be quite the confidence boost as well to have come to this point with two fairly major acquisitions under your belt. Yeah, and we've, you know, we, we've, I suppose, you know, Super Awesome has invested in companies, we've acquired companies. Because the space is, you know, somewhat unusual in that it was ignored by Silicon Valley, in some respects, you know, we have become part of the financing infrastructure. So we are constantly looking at opportunities um, to invest in companies we've invested uh, and acquired in Southeast Asia, um, in Latin America, and um, we've acquired a couple of companies in the UK, and we, we continue to look at those opportunities. Um, and ultimately, I think there's a huge amount of work that needs to be done in terms of, of building out an infrastructure for the children's internet. Um, you know, in, in sort of, you know, four or five years ago, when we used to go around sort of pitching investors, nobody wants to talk about this. We had a huge number of no's. I mean, just a vast amount of people telling us no, this, this didn't make sense, this didn't work, etc. you know, back in the day. And, uh, you know, I think we're now in a position where we can kind of come in and support other founders who realize this is an important thing. We can do that through investment or through acquisition or whatever it is. Right, okay. And um, just interesting to hear you talk about the challenges and, and hearing no a lot, because I know it's one thing our viewers like to hear about is the the trail, when you're on, out on the trail trying to raise capital and, uh, and mistakes that founders sometimes make, would you say there's any mistakes that you've made in your journey or any regrets that you have? Um, I think every company that I'm involved with has a whole new set of mistakes to make. Mm -hmm. I, I think the absolutely the toughest thing about Super Awesome was like, you know, when you, I guess when you read about companies, you know, you read about announcements uh, around investments or whatever, and you don't read about like the, the 400 bad meetings that you had to have, right? And we had, I, I cannot begin to explain how many people told us no early on. Mm. Like, it was just crazy. Like, you think today it, it, it makes sense, hey, we're going to build infrastructure to keep children safe online. That sounds like a super obvious thing, right? Mm. 2013 and 2014, no one wanted to talk about kids. Nobody wanted to talk about privacy at all, right? And I think it's very, very tough for founders. You have to be super resilient, mm. you know, in terms of, in terms of continuing to... to um, to keep going. I think, you know, uh, mistakes, I think more and more as, as we build companies, uh, and it's amazing to see like much younger founders, you know, who are, I think, who, who, who have internalized this and understand it much more innately, you know, build your HR function first. You know, right. build your people function and your recruiting function and your HR function almost before anything else. Mm. I would almost go so far as to say before you've even got a product, build your HR. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I think more and more that just becomes central to doing everything. I, again, that sounds incredibly obvious, yeah. um, but I think there is, you know, it's, 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 you always somehow manage to underestimate people, somehow. Mm -hmm. Well, let's get into that because it may be super obvious to some, but it may be a complete mystery to others. Why would you say it's so important to do that first, maybe even before product in your experience? Why has it mattered so much? Is it culture? Is it um, support around you? I think, you know, people tend to have cognitive blind spots around, um, you know, adjacent um, priorities. And by that I mean, like, you know, when you're starting a company, it will be obvious and apparent to you that you have to build the product because the product is the thing that is delivering the output and the revenue and the return and everything else. It, it's, I think humans cognitively aren't great at prioritizing um, you know, the, the input that goes into that output you know, in terms of prioritizing the humans that go with it because the mm. humans aren't the product per se right in a company. Sure. Um, and I think that it's, 
you know, it's not just about the culture. I think the culture can come from the founder, but I think you have got to create and be able to support all of your people and your team um, at a very, very early stage in terms of giving them growth frameworks, mm. in terms of giving them, you know, making sure that they have all of the things they need, um, you know, to be able to develop. Because a startup is in many respects absolutely the worst place, certainly early on, for structured career development. You're being thrown in, you know, you're getting a huge amount of opportunity, you're getting a huge amount of responsibility, um, but it's, it's definitely unstructured. Mm. Um, and I think you know, that, that ends up sort of having impacts on, on onboarding. It'll have impact on sort of the kinds of people that you can hire, the time that you can put into hiring. And I, I just think you know, any, any founder who scaled a company up to sort of you know, almost any number of people, I think they always come to the realization that they should have invested in people earlier, right? in, in the structure of people earlier. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I think you know, more and more, I, I just feel like, think about your HR and your recruiting and your onboarding and all of that um, before you do anything else. I, I think you know, companies like Stripe have done a tremendous job on that. Okay. Um, and that they think about HR as a product. And while we're on investing in people, I'm going to throw you a bit of a curveball now because I know you have some uh, semi-controversial views on asking people about their family situation when you're <laughs> or when they're pitching to you for investment. I suppose. Uh, I guess that kind of flies in the face of the PC patrol around the globe these days. How do you manage that or the? Uh, the kind of the, the pitfalls of that or the controversy of asking someone straight out what's your family situation and well, why let's 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 provide some context and why well i think I'm, I'm i'm frequently advised by everyone that legally i'm not allowed to ask these questions in interviews anymore um i think you know it's i think um startups are difficult on families you know i mean they simply are um, because of all of the demands um that they place on people so I think it's it's important to understand the context that that someone is coming from, you know. I, I I always like to ask about people's partners to understand where they're coming from. You know, are they coming from a position where they've got the context to understand what their partner would be doing in this company? Do they have experience of a startup? I think if you haven't experienced being involved in that kind of journey, it's very very hard to contextualize it if you're in much more of a career focused situation. You know? So I think you've you got to try and ask those questions. I think the problem is the bigger we get, the more I'm just literally not allowed to not ask allowed, these questions yeah. anymore. But I, I think, look, you got to be, you got, you know, you've, you've, you've got to be real, you got to be direct with people and sort mm -hmm. of say, look, you know, this, this is, this will probably be a much less structured environment than you're used to. Mm -hmm. The rewards are much bigger, the responsibilities are, are, are bigger, the opportunities are definitely much greater. You know, you will learn as much as, 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 as an MBA would probably give you, mm -hmm. but it, that, that has got a certain cost to it. And I think, you know, we don't, we probably, I think, as a founder community, don't really talk about that enough. Mm -hmm. I think we talk about it more than, than, than was spoken about over the last few years, but there's a psychological toll that, that is taken on partners. Mm -hmm. um, we talk, I think it, it's good that we talk about the mental health of founders mm -hmm. a lot more, because yeah. that's, that's definitely a major issue. You know, one of the things I feel like, if, if I'm an investor in a company, the first question I'm asking a founder is, how much are you sleeping right now? Mm -hmm. Um, What's the magic number? What are you looking to hear? I mean, I'm looking. I'm well. I'm looking to hear that someone's thinking about sleep first of all, right. right? Like, I mean, right? I mean, one of the things that would be amazing is that if a standard part of investor agreements became that CEOs and co-founders had to commit to the same sort of rest periods that pilots have to commit to, mm. right? Sleep is sure. the most important thing. It's it's another one of those sort of. Um, cognitive blind spots that we have. And it's the first to go. It, it absolutely yeah. is, right? And you, because people like for years, I mean, this is an, an amazing mistake that I made. Like for years, I was, I was part of that just like idiotic cohort who went, okay, sleep is dead time. Mm -hmm. And how do I minimize sleep? Yeah. Anyone who is doing that is, that is just ridiculous. You should maximize mm -hmm. the amount of sleep you're getting. People spend more time scheduling their gym than they do scheduling sleep. Mm -hmm. And it's funny how this conversation has just evolved, I feel, in the last two to three years, because even maybe 2015, 2016, it was still this Silicon Valley badge of honor 
to be saying, well, how much do you sleep? Well, I'm down to four hours. Yeah, we only yeah. need four hours, you know. Well, yeah, I'm yeah, down yeah. to three, this competitive. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. now it's nearly turned full circle. What it's, do you it's, put that I, down to? I think, it, I wouldn't say it's gone quite that far. Mm. Um, I think people talk about it and pay lip service to it. But I mean, I, I meet a lot of investors all the time and I can probably count on the fingers of one hand, mm. the ones that give a shit to actually ask about that. Right. You know, and that's, so I, I think, you know, I mean, Why We Sleep, which is a very influential book by Matthew Walker, you know, came out a couple of years ago. And I think that that was sort of, you know, a, a pivotal moment where everyone went, okay, sleep is really important and you, you've got to think of it in the same way you think about mental health. I, I think we're probably at a point now where mental health is thought about more than sleep. Now, they're, 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 they're linked. They're certainly very, very adjacent. Oh, they're so interlinked. I don't think people understand well, how much... Yeah, <laughs> right. But, but that's totally to the point. Mm. But, I mean, I think... Um, it's it, it has gotten less bad. I still don't think it's good, you right. know. And I still think that um, you know the 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 requirement for sleep as a founder, you need to prioritize getting good sleep because most of what you're doing um, in, in at almost any stage of a company is problem solving, right? You need good sleep hygiene. You know, this is, I mean, I, I, yeah, I think that's kind of my new crusade. Great. So what we've come away from, I think, from this conversation is you would want, if you were going to invest in someone, you would want them to have a supportive partner, get a lot of sleep and prioritize their HR. Yes. That's a, that, that's a really good list. Yeah. Yeah. I think so too. Yeah. <laughs> we'll leave it there, shall we? Thank you so much, Dylan, for being with us. I'm sure we'll see you soon. Thanks. A super awesome interview with Dylan Collins there. Now I'm back in studio here with Jennifer and Jack, who are about to tell me what their one to watch is for this week. Ladies first. Codex Beauty is a brand that I have become really familiar with over the last few weeks. I've been using it myself and a lot of respect for them. So ultimately they're a natural brand. They've merged with an Irish brand. And not only is the word natural organic huge at the moment, but they have the clinical data and the science to prove it. And often in that space that's quite trending, be it the natural organic green clean sector, there's not a lot of weight behind the words because mm -hmm. it's not regulated, but they've managed to merge the two. So I'm really intrigued to see what they do. Okay, great. What about you, Jack? Yeah, I, I'm more about trends rather than actual ones to watch. And, uh, you know, again, going back to what's happening overseas, uh, if you go to, to the US this summer, it was all about a product called White Claw. White Claw is a hard seltzer, uh, which is a low alcohol, basically uh, vodka and soda. Um, uh, that's out there. But I think it's, it's highlighting um, the opportunity for uh, uh, low calorie, healthy options, functional mm -hmm. drinks um, um, that will be some way linked into uh, actual real benefits. Um, uh, be it with CBD or other products like that. And uh, I think it, it's going to change lower alcohol, you know, products that can create this, the same type of relaxing effect that people can get from alcohol. I think there's something there. I'm not sure where it is. Mm. Um, uh, there's definitely That's growing, isn't it? Like definitely alcohol for, for gym goers. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, and, and, and again, it's, it's finding something that's real. Mm. Um, but, you know, there's a trend there. It's happening. You can see it around the world. Um, uh, I don't have one within that space. It's ca captured it yet, but keep, keep your eyes open. So on that, Jack, what is it about trends in alcohol? Why do they take off when they do? I mean, because White Claw, as you said, popped up pretty much overnight. Yeah, it, it's similar to uh, an old product people might remember, Zima, uh, basically a hard seltzer, as they call it. Mm. Um, I, I think it's down to, 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 there had been a couple of different trends. We probably see it ourselves with, with Rosé and uh, uh, Aperol spritzers and so forth, like, you know, different trends at different times. Mm. Uh, I think this was, was interesting in that it was, it was low, low uh, sugar, okay. so low calorie, um, but it was also accessible to everyone. And it, and it came across as something that, um, uh, you know, that's an alternative to beer. So during the summer months, people were looking for something, again, a younger uh, demographic that didn't necessarily want to have beer because they thought it was you know, high calorific and also, you know, what their parents were probably drinking mm -hmm. and everyone else uh, uh, really tapped into that interest in, in, in low calorie uh, with a perception that it wouldn't give us, us a bad of a hangover and so forth. So, so it tapped into uh, a consumer trend that was happening not only in alcohol but across a multitude of different things and I found it most interesting was it wasn't just men or women it was accessible to everyone okay. uh, and it really you know led it to catch fire so much so that I was in like a 7-Eleven and the shelves were empty because people were coming in just buying in droves so so it was a phenomenal right. uh, uh, trend and the question will be will it maintain or is it just a bit of a fad so mm. some of these things you know when they explode like that 
you know, do they have longevity? I don't know. And any insight into the next one? What will be the next white claw or trend? Yeah, trend? it's... <laughs> Um, uh, uh, if I knew that, I would be you doing it myself. It. But uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, all it's, it's definitely, I think, it's the low calorie. I mm. actually think there's there's going to be more and more interest in low alcohol alternatives as well. Um, uh, so you can still have the same type of experience, but mm. without some of the, the knock-on effects of, of drinking um, the alcohol. So I think it's pretty hard for someone who's actually in the alcohol industry to say that, but sure. there's definitely uh, uh, an ongoing interest in that. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Jennifer Rock from The Skin Nerd and Jack Teeling from Teeling Whiskey. Thank you for being with us. Thanks to AIB for backing all in and thanks to you for being with us. On the next show, we're reimagining the working week. How many hours a day should you be working? How many days a week? And how can you hit peak productivity? Well, VC Brian Caulfield will be among those joining me to discuss that. And of course, we'll have another all-in Trailblazer interview, this time with 19-year-old Shane Kern, who's just landed a seven-figure investment from two of the world's top VC funds. Don't forget to check out our pinned tweet on our dedicated Twitter account, at allin underscore business, for details on how you can get tickets to be in the audience of our first live all-in show, the 29th of October, in the Chocolate Factory on King's Inn Street in Dublin. And as always, hit subscribe so that you never miss a show.